This has become a tough area in our society. Understand that when we are committed to preaching the full counsel of God, sometimes that full counsel goes into sensitive areas. And when it does, it is not so that we can beat people up, so that we can point the finger and say, here's it, you're doing this wrong, I'm not. It is so that we get God's heart and we understand where God is on the matter. And so this morning, as we get into this particular word and as we begin to, 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 to unpack what the Lord was saying here, I want you to hear who is saying it. It is the Lord himself that is talking. It is the Lord that is directing and instructing. And it is the Lord that is sharing his heart. And you and I both know that he shares both out of love and compassion, but he also shares with a loving warning as well. We know that Christ can get stern and get strict. We saw him. Usually he reserved that for those that should have known better, and were choosing not to live better. He was focusing on those hypocrites. He was focusing on those that, 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 that were thinking they were doing something for God when they were doing something for themselves. And so this morning, as we read it, I want you to hear the love of God, but I also want you to hear the warning of God. I'm not going to let any of us off the hook, but I'm not going to drive a hook through you either. Um. And so with that, I am going to ask, I know we normally stand. Believe me, God is not going to strike you if you don't stand when he's reading his word. We will continue to do that. But I want you to sit and listen as I read it this morning. And I'm going to ask that they not even put it up on the board until we read through it. I want you just to hear what the Lord is saying. And then there is some explanation, and then we're going to jump into it. Amen? Amen. So let me read it. It is Matthew chapter 5. And we know now that Jesus had talked about fulfilling the law. I mean, he is the fulfillment of the law, or as we said, he is what the law pointed toward, or he is the one that gives, I mean, he is the goal of the law. Let me put it this way. Since, since the law focused on and, and, and pointed toward him, he is its ultimate interpreter, and so that's why you're going to see today, he says, and, and the last time we were here, he says, you have heard it said, but I say. You hear the authority in that. He is giving the meaning that God intended from the beginning. Thus, he can say, I'm not getting rid of the law at all. As a matter of fact, he, he digs in deeper and says, if anyone changes anything in this and teaches anyone not to follow this, he says, you will be leased. In the kingdom, you, and you saw that Jesus lived according to the law perfectly. But what he was doing for you and I, what he was doing for you and I was helping us to understand that he gives ultimate definition to the law. That was what the Pharisees had issue with. Boy, they were angry. They were thinking, man, you talking like this is, this is, this is yours to say whether it is or not. And he's like, it is. Dude, you, you, you over here talking like you God. That's because I am. And so as we listen and as we read through this, I want you to hear it. And you're saying, man, that's a lot of upfront explanation. Just listen. Matthew 5, 27 through 32, it says, You have heard that it was said, <clears throat> you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of, of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. 
the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, your word is there to show what you desire, who you are, and what you want out and from us. And I pray this morning, O God, that we would hear not only your words, but we would hear your heart. And we would know that it comes with great love, although great warning. Give us wisdom today in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so now understand, Jesus, as I said, he is the one that sits it up and he says, I am the law's ultimate interpreter. I am the one who is going to give you the intended meaning, not just today, but the intended meaning when it was given. That's what you have to understand. See, the, the, the full interpretation and intent of the law was intended to be given when the one who would be its interpreter could do it. And that was Jesus himself. And all along that people were living based on what they had heard and how they could live it. But understand, here are some things I want us to understand as we look at this. Number one, <clears throat> as I said, Jesus, his authority must be realized and accepted. We must accept him as the ultimate interpreter. We must, must. If we don't, if we don't, we're going to miss what he is trying to say. We're going to miss it. Number two, we must, uh, Jesus, his audience must be remembered here. Who was he talking to directly and those who he knew was hearing him. Number one, he was talking to his disciples. Remember at the beginning, he said he called his disciples to him. Although there were greater crowds, as you read the account of Sermon on the Mount, you hear the greater crowds that were around. Although he was talking to his disciples, he knew that those who were not and others standing around would hear him. And so you must understand his audiences included in that would have been some of those Pharisees. Understand the context. Also, Jesus is Context must be understood here. He not only was giving them what, uh, what is the standard for the kingdom. Remember, this whole series is on characteristics of the kingdom. What does a kingdom citizen look like? How do they live? What do they value? What's going on? And so Jesus is now giving the standards. He is giving the characteristics of this new kingdom. And we saw in those Beatitudes, boy, blessed, you know, blessed is, and we saw the blessed life, and that's not the definition we would give if someone asked you, what is the blessed life? We wouldn't go to Matthew 5. But Jesus laid it out for the kingdom. Understand the kingdom of God is countercultural to society. The kingdom of God is reversed, is different. And so Jesus is laying it down. And so he's not laying it down to throw anyone under the bus. He is laying it down to bring clarity and to bring its intention. And so look at what he says here. And so Jesus' context must be understood. Understand also the law at this particular time. Man, you have to understand. Get this, please. The law at this particular time had been under the leadership of these Pharisees and scribes, these religious leaders for years. Hundreds of years now have gone by, and they have, <clears throat> they have added to it. They have given their own interpretation. They have, they have, they have in, their, in their pursuit of clarifying, what they were really doing was setting it up for their benefit. This group had become this elitist group. They had become this group of people that were, although they were giving the law, they were benefiting from their own interpretation of the law. And so because they were doing that, the waters were completely muddied. What did God really say? And so what we're getting here is when Jesus says, you've heard it said, sometimes he is going directly to what the Old Testament law stated. Sometimes he is referring to the mess that has been created by these leaders. 
And when we're talking about this issue of divorce, a mess had been created. Why? Because they had now, it was by permission, they said, you know, that Moses allowed it. God through Moses had allowed it. And there was an exception here. But, but, but the mess that it had developed into was that they had created all kinds of scenarios in which you could divorce your wife. Now, understand, back in that context, the reverse was not possible. Women did not have that right. So understand that the, the context was different, but what he's speaking to was the mess that was created. As a matter of fact, it is believed by some that some of the, some of the rabbis of that time that they had so many stipulations that a man could divorce his wife and he didn't like the way she cooked. She burnt the food too much. You are gone. But understand, too, what happened is in this society, in this culture, an unmarried or a formerly married woman is an unprotected one. She had no one to look over, and abuse was prevalent. You can be taken advantage of. You can can have things happen that should not And at this time, in this particularly male-dominated culture, without the rights that, that, that today many women have, what we see here was they had created this system that benefited them, and they acted like God's stamp of approval was on it. And so when Jesus comes, he clarifies the waters. He cleans it. And I know they heard it, part of why. That's why at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, they said, he speaks like one with authority, not like the scribes. Boy, how would you like to follow me? How would you like someone to follow you preaching? All my preachers here. And then the people say, boy, he speaks with authority, not like those other guys. (laughs) But the deal was he was one who has authority. And I want you to look at what he says. The other thing in these six, as we said that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law, there were these six statements that people believe are contradictory to the law. They're not. He is actually, as I said earlier, he is now giving example of what the fulfillment of the law is. The last time we we were on this, we saw anger. It's interesting that 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 the commandment that it was referring to was thou shalt not murder, as it was. But Jesus, because again, anger is implied, it's not talked about, but it's thought about when, 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 whenever murder is prohibited. The anger that causes it is implied. Although we don't hear him talk about anger, the law doesn't talk about anger. Jesus now takes it to its intent. He said, you guys are thinking you're so righteous because you've not killed anyone physically. But he says, but I say to you, all of you have done it over and over and over again by your anger and the way that you treat it. Why? Because murder doesn't start when you shoot the gun, stab the knife, strangle, whatever you do, run someone over. That is the culmination of what's been happening inside all along. And Jesus gets to the root. I love this. He gets to the root. He says, yes, murder is prohibited, but let me get to the root. The real problem is there is this sin brewing in your heart, in your life, that if it goes unchecked, can explode in a number of ways. We got this thing now called road rage today. No, it's not road rage. It's people rage on the road. Humans getting angry, unchecked, and do things that they later regret. Some of them. Some of them don't regret it. Anger is running so high. Some of the racism, some of the, <clears throat> some of the other things that we see here, it, it, it's, it didn't start when you performed that act. That's the culmination of it. And that's what Jesus is getting to. And so now when he gets to this, now he gets into, <clears throat> and, and, and you can 
Put it up if you guys have it now. Now when he gets to 27, he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. He is referring to the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. That is a direct referral to it. He says, you've heard it said. But look at what he does, just like he did with anger. He takes it to where it all begins. He says, and, and, and just real quick, Jesus defines the seventh commandment, and he gives greater clarity to the seventh commandment by the tenth. He said, what's the tenth? Thou shalt not covet your neighbors. He says, he's talking about now possessions, and covet is this whole deep desire for someone else's stuff based on greed and dissatisfaction with what you have. Actually, it is idolatry. And so you want it and you want it, and so you go after it. And so it's with that in mind that he goes now and he says, you have heard it said you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, he's interpreting it now, he's giving the clarity, everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow, do you see all the intent? He says, there's a couple of things happening here. He says, let me help you guys with that. Y'all think y'all are doing something because you've set it up such that even when you do commit adultery, you've set the system up that it doesn't seem like adultery. And he says, let me give clarity to it. He said, it is in the heart. In the heart, it expresses itself in a look. Now, understand here, that whole lust, you have to understand that word. It is not just a glance. And that word lust, it is, it really means to, to and, and that look upon to lust, it is that long stare with a desire following and usually details following. And no one else knows what's going on in that but you. Oh, I'm sorry, and God. (laughs) See, God looks at the heart, and he sees, although you might have given a quick look, and you may turn away, you are still looking. That although, and and in this case, he is talking about sexual desire. That's what he's talking about. Yes, in, in, in this case, but understand, lust is, this is not the only place lust brings up his ugly head. I want to bring one that, boy, I, I, think, I think many of us down that road have dealt with, it is this lust for more and more money that causes us to go in and, boy, I'm going to get in trouble on this one, go in and either have a computer pick it for me or I pick it. Why do I do it? What, what am I after? Do I not have enough with what I have now? Is, 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 there some, is, is God not providing? Am I not trusting people saying, Pastor, you are, you are messing. Keep going. <laughs> I'm a mess. Because we all have, we all have, hear me say that we all have struggled with desires. I was... <laughs> I was in the store. I had to check this desire. Boy, where did that come from? Here I am getting ready to teach on this this week. I'm walking through the store, and boy, this thought just comes right through the head. It would be good to walk through here knowing that I am so loaded. I can just pick up anything. And I was like, ooh, that evil heart. Lord, deal with it. I mean, but here's the deal. We lust for many things. Why? What is lust? It is this deep desire, personal desire for something purely for your own pleasure and benefit without regard to the consequences that come. That is lust. And so he says here, the intent in your heart that you've gone through with that woman. He's talking to the disciples, but he knows all the people hear it, including the Pharisees that have worked the system. He says, you've already committed. Why? Because that's where it starts. 
But it's interesting that he talks about adultery and then he leads into divorce. Understand this. It is that lustful heart that leads to a divorcing situation many times or those that create the situation that it does. It can be a lust for another person, a lust for more in my career. I begin to disassociate myself with my relationships because of the lust that is burning in my heart for more and more and more of whatever it is. And we get this thing that the kingdom citizen, he says, because he is, because the kingdom citizen is allowing themselves to understand what the blessed life is. Let's go back to the beginning of chapter 5. Because they're understanding what the blessed life is, they are able to handle those things in society that others cannot. And so, blessed are the poor in spirit, I come and I realize even this week my own brokenness and my fallenness and, 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 the, and the areas where I'm still wanting the Lord to work in my life, boy, they just came so evident. This was, this was a tough week for me because here I am looking at how I share this text carefully and sensitively, and I'm just reminded of my own fallenness and my own heart's you know, mess and, and the stuff that's there. And I'm just like, Lord, I'm a mess. And you know what I remembered? I remembered blessed are the poor in spirit. I remembered that. I remembered that, God, I am totally bankrupt and that I fall on you for help daily. See, God is not saying the fact that those thoughts or those things or that look comes to you is the issue. He says, they're going to come to you because you're bankrupt. You're fallen. You're broken. He says, but you don't need to give it a place. He says, you have who is in you is enough to rise up in you. And you go, I'm not going there today. I'm not letting that take advantage of me. I'm not, I'm not moving down that pathway of lust, however lust rears its head, whether it's in my career, my education, my friendships, my relationships, my marriage, whatever it is. But in this particular case, he says, you guys think you're okay because you're not committing adultery. He says, oh, he says, but let me tell you, you actually are because your heart is set up for it. You just don't have the right situation to allow you to take part in it. Why do you think so many people say, I never intended for that to happen? Well, of course you did in that it was going on in your mind and heart. It's just that now you had an avenue to get there. And God says, close the street down and there's no way to it. There is a street up by us. We live up by, we don't live far from um, Hamilton Town Center. <clears throat> and, and, and there's a frustrating street there, 141st. It is frustrating. Why is it frustrating? Because it'll only take you to a certain point. They've not built it all the way through. And if they built it all the way through, it would make our life first world problems. It would make our life a little easier. I wouldn't have to either go up to 146 and come down or go down to 136 and come up. I could just go straight because I'm right near 141st. And so the first time I tried, I, I got there and it said road closed. And then when you get to the other side by the mall, as you're coming back, it says road closed. And so there's this section of no road. So it is impossible for me to drive my car down that section of what is not 141st. It's impossible. And I say for you and I, when we shut it down, when we allow the Lord to close it off through his power, when we don't allow the lust to linger and to settle in, God says, you've just put up a road closed sign and you're not going down it. And so God says, you want to deal with adultery? You want to deal with it? He says, check your heart lusts and you will. But then here's what he says, though. He doesn't just deal with lust. He goes into the scripture, boy, that it seems like, hold on a second, Lord. Do you really mean what you just said? He said, so if your right eye, not your left, it's interesting. He said, your right eye. I don't know how one eye causes you to sin unless you're one-eyed. 
I have no idea how one eye causes you to sin. So that's how I know he's not talking about something literal. Because you have two eyes. The average person has two eyes. There weren't a whole bunch of one-eyed disciples on that hill that day. So when he said, if your right eye causes you to sin, I, the people understood it as well. If your right eye causes you to sin, he said, gouge it out. Can you imagine that? The pain, the sight. First of all, who can do that? If I accidentally poke myself in the eye, I'm, I'm, I'm on the floor rolling almost. But it says to take your eye, gouge it, and here it is, though, and throw it away. Now, hold on a second. Not keep it so that a doctor can reattach it. <clears throat> take it and throw it away. But then he says, because it is better, it is better that you go in maimed than you get your whole body. And hear the, hear the force with it that your whole body is thrown into hell. Whoa. Oh, Jesus, hold on. Can you imagine what the crowd was thinking? I did. I'm like, what are they thinking when he says that? Take that eye, gouge it out, throw it away, and that'll keep you from going to hell. No. But then he says, or if your right hand, in some societies, they do that. You're caught stealing. They cut that joker off. But the problem is they haven't dealt with the problem. The problem is not the hand. The problem is the heart that tells the hand to reach. And so he says, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off. What is Jesus saying here? The way that you and I are going to deal with this issue of lust, because it is a beast. It is a roaring lion almost in our lives. He says you have to deal with it radically. He says you can't play with it. How many of y'all the last time you pet a tiger? How many? And you still have an arm. How many of you will go and play with a black mamba snake? And when they bite you, you better have that serum within a minute's distance of you. Otherwise, you will drop. The venom is so poisonous. How many of us will, there are some people that we will lay amongst cobras. See, the deal is, he says, it is hard to get over a sin that you keep petting and enjoying. You can't. And so we make all kind of, and I say we, I include me in this, we make all kind of excuses and we give that wonderful spiritual answer. Here it goes, Lord, I'm struggling with this. And here's the struggle. The struggle is I really like it and I don't want to get rid of it. That's the struggle. And so what I've now said is, Lord, you know this is hard. I'm praying that you will help me not to give gratification to these appetites that are sinful, whatever they are. Pray the real prayer, folk. God knows the heart anyway. And so when I read this, I'm like, okay. So he says, deal radically with sin. Don't mess with it. Don't play with it. Throw it away. What in your life is God calling you to throw away? Is he calling you to gouge out and toss it? Is he telling you with pain? Understand this, with pain. Both of those instances refer to pain happening. Cut your arm off and find out how much pain you're in. I'm not talking about the sanitized Western world way they give you anesthetic and they numb you up and they put you to sleep and they surgically remove it and you wake up and you don't know anything has happened except you don't have a... No, we're not talking about that because that wasn't around back then. And so when you cut that thing off, that's like getting an ax and just going to work. Wham! And the pain that would be there. There will be pain involved, he said. And so he says to you and I, whatever is causing us to sin, deal with it, although it causes pain. He said, because it is better to deal with sin that causes pain than to embrace it, fooling yourself, thinking you're in the kingdom when you're not, and you end up at the end of life. Instead of being with God, you are. And what's implied in that, and there are people that can be fooling themselves fake disciples 
who never deal with sin, always giving excuse to it, never letting people know that they are in bed with it, never knowing that they are running with it, they are partners and buddies because they never deal with it radically. God wants us to treat our sin as if it was a tiger in the room. Get close and find out what happened. Now we know. You say, boy, that's impossible. Well, let's go back. Matthew chapter, I mean, Matthew 5, those first verses, those first eight. Blessed are, we talk about the blessed life. Blessed are the poor. They're, blessed are those who mourn. What do we say with the mourning? You are mourning over your sin. You're not meddling in it. You are mourning over it. We go back to the blessed life. God says, it will, hey, let me just warn you, it will cause pain. You will not get out of this easy. You will not get out of this unscathed. But here's what Jesus says. It's worth it. He says, because you're in the kingdom, you're with me. I love you. He is not. Now understand what he said there. But then he goes into this other one of divorce and understand the mess that had been created. But what you also see is the tremendous value of Jesus that he has for marriage. You see the high value. You see how he holds it in high regard. That's why you see him so passionate. But also, that's why you see him give a warning, and that's why you see him give what God desires. He knows that there have been all kind of exceptions made in this case, but he comes back and says there's one. Now, let me stop right there. If you find yourself in this category at all, Hold on a second. I'm going to look at the clock because I don't want anyone thinking I'm looking at you. If you find yourself in this category at all, the forgiveness of God is strong. It is there. God has done it. What has happened on the cross has settled it for you. You don't live in condemnation. You live in the glory and the strength of God, Amen. period. Amen. But understand, it still doesn't change God's standard what God desires of us. And for those who are not in it yet, God says, hear my standard well, both lovingly and warningly. If that's a, even a word, teachers, I don't know. Here he says, he says, if he says, verse, verse um, 31, it was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. That's what Moses had allowed. But I say to you, everyone who divorces his wife except on the grounds of sexual immorality makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Understand the context that he's talking about. He says, my whole deal is, yes, there is an exception. And God says, and here it is. And he says, boy, Lord, that's hard. God says, make sure this is what you want to enter into on the front end before you do it. Because there are not 30 out clauses. God says, I hold it high and I hold it in regard. He says, make sure this is what I want and make sure this is what you want. Understand that well. And he goes, hear it. But he also says here, what he's not saying, because he deals with it in, in other texts, he is dealing with the mess that was created. When you deal with the mess, you have to give what the standard is. Okay, what's the real way this is supposed to be done? He says, here's the real way, kingdom citizens. Now, the context for us is a little different. What's the context? Boy, today, it is so okay. It was not okay, even culturally back then. That's why the Pharisees were making so many laws to make themselves look right. Because it was not okay culturally. Today, it's totally okay. No one frowns upon it at all. As a matter of fact, for many, it's expected culturally. But understand, God says, in my kingdom, he says, I give the strength and hope that it doesn't have to be. But if it is, boy, my grace is sufficient. My strength is there. My forgiveness is there. You can walk forward strong and you can now look at life based on what you now know and just keep moving forward. And once again, if, if you start to be reminded of your past, hopefully when you look back, what you see is the cross and that it is all laid there. But God says going forward, 
here's what I want you to know. And you go, God, how can anyone live to that standard? I had one guy ask me, how on earth, man, can you spend your whole life with one woman? You you act like that's strange. And now, you know what, bro? To you, I know it is. But let me tell you what God has done and how he helps me and what love is and what, and, and, and here's the deal, what care is, what compassion is. Here's why. Boy, not that we get it right and I brush it off and, hey, I'm doing good and y'all aren't. No, is that day in and day in, I realize how bankrupt I am. I realize how I have to mourn over my sin. Notice I didn't say my wife's sin, my sin. Um, and, 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 and just in case you guys are wondering, and yeah, she's going to hate the fact that she's on tape. She's traveling back today. That's why she's not here. She wasn't trying to skip out. So y'all be like, well, why was she here today? <laughs> there you go. She is, she is in Atlanta traveling back today which is why she is not here with us, because she was like, I'm praying for you on this one. I was like, she was like, oh boy. She was like, I really don't, you know, she says, I'm really sad that I'm missing that. And I was like, really? (laughs) She says, no, really I am, because she says, I like to look around and to to be able to see what's happening and how people are responding. Here's my point with that boy. This is not a message you to go out of here feeling down and dumps, but God is saying, standard warning, but with the grace of God covering it all. Standard warning, grace of God covering all. And I love how the Lord does this. And you know what? I know this has been used to knock people out. I have a friend who said, I have a friend who said he was turned away from the church through the way that that, the way that his church handled his I mean, his mother's divorce and the, the, the thing that's what happened and how the church turned her away, how they turned away from her and, 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 and put the family out there. And he said, I turned away from it then. And he hadn't turned back. That's not God's intent. Never is. Never will be. Jesus gives the standard and the Pharisees had so abused it And he comes back in love and says, here it is, y'all. And so understand that as we go forward, here's what we learn. Anger, we saw that a few weeks ago. Anger, if left unchecked because it is a heart issue, can lead to murder. He says lust, if it is unchecked and not dealt with, can lead to adultery for those that are married. But it can lead to so many other things for those in so many other areas. One of them, he says, is divorce. He says it is implied that adultery and then divorce. He says that lust is implied, but now Jesus makes it front and center. The reason for many of the problems here is that it starts here. So what is, what are you and I to do? We ought to go to God because of the work of Christ and say, I need your help. I am bankrupt and I am mourning and yet I know I am fully loved. How do I know that? Because in Romans talks about while we were still sinners, Christ died. It isn't like, here's what he said. It wasn't God said, get your act together and then I'll come and I'll help you. You know those crazy sayings that we think are biblical but they're not? You know, like God helps those who help themselves. Why do you need Jesus? But you can help yourself. I never liked that one. No, God helps those who fall on and call on him. Amen. You know the other one. Cleanliness is next to godliness. No, a clean house is cool, but you can be as wicked as can be and have a clean house. It's not God. But God says, fully loved fully known, fully accepted as you come to him confessing what he already knows and letting him deal with it. You don't need to feel some sort of sense of second, third rate. God says, I don't have any. All the people in my kingdom are first class because they're in my kingdom, period. But you know and you love the standard. 
because he says, now you know how I want you to live. And here it is, you know the benefit and the joy that will come from it if you do. So today, be encouraged as we hear it. God says, all of these things that we say as legal prohibitions, boy, they start in the heart. And if you and I start in the heart, we will clip all of those actions out. If we start in the heart, none of those things will have a chance. It will be a closed road. If we start in the heart, all those things that could be, won't be. And even if they may happen to be, the blood of Christ covers them. And so I now come back again strong in the Lord. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That should be every last one of us in here. Blessed are those who mourn. I hope that's all of us. Because as we do, the Lord responds. 